Okay, let's go. So, question five, B, part two. So, we just quickly we kind of rush through this. So, so we proved part one. We proved that ought G set of automorphisms is a group under function composition. And then we wanted to classify ought Z8. So remember, we made the observation that Z8 plus is a cyclic group. The generators are generated by any of So anything co prime to eight will be generated. So one, three, five, or seven. Okay, so there's four generators. And um, I'm going to have no battery on my phone. Um, by any of one, three, five, or seven. Um, yeah, so describe all the elements of Z8. So, a property of isomorphisms a property of an isomorphism phi from any group to any group is that for all elements x of the group the order of the element is the same as the order of the image of it okay. so isomorphisms by the immediate consequence of kind of a have a morphism property in the fact that it's a one to one and, and, and uh, fact it's objective, that the order is preserved. So that means so phi of one has to be one three five seven, yeah. One four one of one, three, five, seven. <coughs> for a nice for five being an automorphism of set eight. And the second point is, moreover, Phi is fully determined by phi of one. Okay. Why did you choose phi of one? I just chose one of the generators to focus on. So I could have chosen any one, but one seems the kind of canonical generator, I guess, in a way. Um, so phi is going to be fully determined by phi of one for an extension of the homomorphism property. Extension of the homomorphism property is phi of n, which is phi of one plus one plus you know some number of copies of one. That's just going to be phi of one plus phi of one plus phi of one. So it's just going to be n times phi of one. So once you know what phi of n, once you know what phi of one is, all other values of it are determined from that. So the isomorphism has to send one to one of the four generators. And once you know, once you've assigned a value to phi of one, that determines the rest of the isomorphism. Okay. So there will be there will be four automorphisms. Let's call them Tempted to call them phi one, phi two, phi three, but then that kind of confuses with 
tempted to call them phi subscript 3, phi subscript 5, phi subscript 7. So we know what the identity is. Um, phi 3 sends 1 to 3. Phi 5 is going to send 1 to 5. And phi 7 is going to send 1 to 7. Okay. So the rest of phi will be the rest of, of, of the phi will be fully determined through through this thing here by um, by the value of phi. So what was this question? First of all, the question was asking us to list all the elements. Okay. Well, okay. I've kind of indicated what the elements are there. So let's list. Let's define each one as a permutation. Permutation from from S eight. Okay. It's a bijective mapping of Z eight to itself. So we can think of it as a as a permutation on. Eight, ob um, on eight objects. So you've got the elements 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So we're going to have four of these 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And another four. So I'll put it in the two line notation first. But then I'll want to express it as a product of disjoint cycles so that I can see what's going on with these elements and what their orders are. So is everybody with me so far? So we're now going to list the identity, <coughs> the automorphism phi 3, the automorphism phi 5, and the automorphism phi 7. Yep. Well, the identity is easy. That's just 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. All of the, these are isomorphisms. They all they're homomorphisms. They all send the identity to the identity. Zero is the identity element of this group. Um, so five, 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 three is sending one to three. Five, five is sending one to five. Five, seven is sending one to seven. So the rest of the five will be will be will be generated by that. So five two is going to be three plus three. Well, 2 is 1 plus 1. So now I'm applying this rule here. So 5, 2 is going to be 2 times 5, 1. I'm going to apply this rule now to extend all of these. So, um, well, 3 plus 3 is 6. This is going to be 3 times 3, which is 9, which is 1. 4 is going to be 4 times 3, which is 12, which is 4. Mod eight, because everything's mod eight, of course. Five is going to be sent to five times three, which is fifteen, which is seven. Six goes to six times three, which is eighteen, which is two. And seven times three, twenty-one, which is should be the missing one, five. Sixteen plus five. Okay. So you can extend. You can fully see all the what each what each one's doing. So this one is two point five. Which 2 times 5, which is 10, which is 2. 3 times 5, which is 15, which is 7. 4 times 5, which is 20, which is 4. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 16. It's 4, yeah. yeah. Well, 5 times 5, which is 25, which is 1. Yeah. 6 times 5, which is 30, which is um, 6. Right here. And seven times five, which is thirty-five, which has to be three. Yeah, thirty-two plus three. Lastly, this one. <laughs> Two times seven. I think this is gonna be all negatives, isn't it? Two times seven. Two times seven. Yeah, which is fourteen, which is six. Three times seven, which is twenty-one, which is five, four, three. <laughs> okay. That's just the nature of it. See, 7 is minus 1. So here you're just multiplying each element by minus 1. Yeah. Okay, now let's get... Now, we, it, it wants us to determine... So... Uh, <coughs> 
then classify all seven by making use of the classification of finite Lie groups. Okay, in, in cycle notation, so let's pick out cycle notation for each of these. The ID, the identity is obviously like a trivial cycle. Five, three, so what's five, three? One goes to three, goes to one, two goes to six, goes to two, uh, four goes to four, and we got a five, seven. Five, seven, five, five is one goes to five, two goes to two, three goes to seven, By seven is one seven two six. So you, you're you're noticing something here. Okay. They're all products of disjoint two cycles. So every element has order two. Each non-identity element. Seven has order two, as they are products of disjoint two cycles. Transpositions, two cycles. Okay. Remember, if you're looking at a product of cycles, the order of the elements is the least common multiple of the lengths of the cycles. So these are each of the disjoint cycles is order two in the non-identity elements of the non-identity elements. Since the underlying no, because because all the elements of order two, that means the group is a Bly. That was a lemma we had. Remember that? You use that in, in part of your you use that as remember as part of the last question on the coursework in a group where all elements of order two. Group is a Bly. Okay. Such a group where all non identity elements of order two is a Bly. So by the finite, by the fundamental theorem finite abelian groups, or Z8 is isomorphic to Z, there, there are only two, there are only two abelian, two isomorphism classes of abelian groups of order four, okay, think of the different ways you can break down four, the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, chapter 13. So which one of these two is it? <laughs> so is it, is it Z4 or Z2 cross Z2? Z2 two cross 2. Yeah, why? Because Z4 has non, uh, has um, elements with high order. Yeah. So Z4 is sigma. It's got two elements of order 4 in it. <laughs> well, it's because it's cyclic, it's yes. generated by one and three. Yes. So they're elements of order four. But we've just said, we just found, we just discovered that everything in all Z8 has, well, is either the identity or has order two. So that has to be this one. Okay. All the elements here have order two. All the, all, all the non identity elements. So therefore, therefore, or Z8 is isomorphic to Z2 cross Z2, as Z4 has elements of order 4. So that's the treatment to that. So yeah, that, that was good. You have to do a little bit of permutations and 
cycle of decomposition. Uh, because that's what the fundamental theorem of finite abelian group says. Mm -hmm. It says that whatever the order of the abelian group is, mm -hmm. the different isomorphism classes are the different non-isomorphic ways of taking the products of cyclic groups, such that the product of all the orders will be the order of the group. You need to look back at the results in chapter 13, fundamental theorem of finite abelian group. For, for groups of order four, there's just two possibilities. So if it was that six, what would that be? Well, the possibilities for, yeah, so the possibilities for Z6. So if the order of G is six, mm -hmm. then the fundamental theorem of finite abelian group says, and if G is abelian, G will be isomorphic to, yes, Z6 is one. Well, in fact, there's not too many for Z6. It's just Z6 and Z. Ah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What is it about this one? This one, is, this one, in fact, is isomorphic to Z6 because mm -hmm. these things, these, these, these are these are coprime. If they're coprime, they're they're co-prime, then the direct product is isomorphic to Z, the product of those two. So actually, there's only one abelian group of order six, just Z6. In fact, wasn't that a consequence that there's only one abelian group of order P times Q, where P and Q are distinct primes? It has to be cyclic, it has to be Z, P, Q. Yeah, but what I'm saying, you could, you could choose for the top one. Z4 multiplies Z2 as a question. No, because that would have, that would be a group of order 8. Z4 like cross Z2. That would have 8 elements. But we know this is a, a 4 element. So there's only 4 automorphisms of Z8. Okay. Should we move on to question six? Then? Yep. Okay, so some of this is work definitions here. So this is Group actions, a GV group, an X, a non-empty set. State the definition of a left action of G on X. Okay. So I'll say left action, G on X. What? <laughs> it's where each element G of G <laughs> where each element G of G generates a permutation meaning a bijection permutation x to x. Okay? So it's a way of assigning to each element from the group a mapping from the set x to itself which satisfies two key properties that say that the group nature of G is respected by these mappings. And that means two things. Um, well, let's just say we're going to write this. Yeah, so we'll, we'll <coughs> satisfying these properties. So 
let's just say we will write we will write the <laughs> write the mapping <laughs> as we will write yeah right. <laughs> g of x equals y yeah <clears throat> Okay, so you know to mean to mean that the map associated to G sends X to Y. Yeah. So these aren't group products. Well, when you see these kind of things being written down, they aren't group products. There, it's the it's, this is the action. This is the the bijection associated to G acting on X and giving the value Y. So the two properties it. gives is the identity element generates the identity map. That's what I mean by respecting the group structure. The identity element, the map associated to it has to be the identity. So i.e. for every x in x, ex equals x. It even just it even looks like the group identity property, that E times G is equal to G, except it's technically it's not a group product within the group G, it, this is the action of the identity element from G on an element from the set X, and it's, it always has to give you back the same value X, so it's, it's the identity map on X, on the set X. And secondly, for all pairs of elements G and H within the group G, the mapping associated with the product element GH is the composition of the two mappings. GH acting on X is going to be equal to G acting on H acting on X. G acting on the result of H acting on X. So, i.e., GH generates the mapping composite composition of the mappings uh, G and H. Okay, so product operation in the group corresponds to the composition of the mappings that those elements are associated to. So that's a group action. Think of it kind of, it's, it's a way for the group to move around the elements of X, for each group element to move around the elements of X in a certain way, in a, in a, in a permutation. Okay. So I think something like that would attract, uh, attract full marks. It's more or less the book, the book definition. So the key point is, it's a way of associating to every element in the group a permutation of the set of X in such a way that it respects the group structure, meaning the identity element is the identity map, and the map associated to a product of elements is the composition of the maps associated to each element. So this is what a left action. leftiness of it is to do with the way this association is here. If, if it was a right action, then these the, the G would go on the right of X. So the mapping associated to G H would be this composition, which is H after G. This is G acting first, then H. Whereas the left action, it's H acting first, then G. That's the left right nature of it. Okay, two definition of stabilizer and orbit. So G sub X and curly O of X. So these can be defined quite cleanly with just giving their set theoretic definition. So G sub X the stabilizer of X, so it's everything that stabilizes X. So X is little X is stabilized when it doesn't move. 
it's everything that doesn't move this particular element, little x. So it's the set of all group elements such that g of x is equal to x. Okay. It's always going to be non-empty because the identity element is always there. Because by definition, the identity fixes everything. And there can be other elements there. In fact, the stabilizer, remember, it's, it's, a, it's a subgroup. It's not asked here, but in previous years, I think we've asked the group the stabilizers a subgroup perhaps. So that's the stabilizer. It's, it's, it's the subgroup. I mean, you wouldn't have, have to write this down, but just to give it context. It's the subgroup of elements fixing x. Orbit, curly O of X. Again, it's very easy to get the set theoretic definition of like this, and it's really just a kind of a mirror image of the one on top. So the orbit, I think the idea, the metaphor is, you know, something orbits the Earth. The orbit is the set of positions that you move through. That this element, little X, moves through. So it's the set of positions it moves through. So it's the set of values g times x as g ranges over every possible element from the group g. Okay. So it's all the possible places that x can get moved to through multiplying it or acting on it by the permutation associated to little g. And that's for all g. So it's quite, you know, they, 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 they look almost identical. You know, it just looks like you flip the two things. but. They're different. The, the stabilizer G sub X is a subgroup of the group. The orbit is a subset of the set X. It's on the other side. The, 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 the orbit is a set, a subset of X. This is a subgroup of, of the group G. The orbit is the set of elements. moves through, you could say, moves through by acting with elements, elements from G. But just the two set theoretical ones, which is enough. Part three proof there is it. So I think this is one of the steps in the orbit stabilizer theorem. Prove there is a bijection between the orbit of X and the set of left cosets of G of X and G. So we have to prove there's a bijection. So I guess we have to construct a map phi. Phi is going to go from the orbit, the orbit of little x, to the set of left cosets of g, x, in g. This set is the set of left cosets, little g, g sub x, as little g ranges over all the Greek elements g. So this is the set of cosets. So we kind of need to know what the map is before we can start proving it's a bijection, don't we? Yeah, so we need to, we need to just make a stab at defining the map. 
Yeah, because how can you show a map as a bijection until you have the map in your hands and you can interrogate it and prove things about it? Yeah. So this making progress with this part would rely on knowing what the definition of this map is. I'm going to try and convince you that there's only one reasonable way to do the mapping. So it should, it should come to you naturally. It just has to spill out onto the page because there's only one reasonable answer if you approach it in the right way. So how do you define a map? So you have to take an element from the set you're mapping from. Yeah. You have to be able to say what the value of the map on that element is. And it has to be one of these left cosets. So the question is, which left coset is it going to be? Now, to pick out a left coset, you have to pick an element little g. Where is the element little g? There doesn't appear to be an, a, a, a natural element little g here. But there is. What is it? It's going to come out of, somehow there's a little g buried within y, right? And there is, because y has come from the orbit. So it is, it must be possible to write y as a little g times x or some g, okay? because y is in the orbit of this particular element, little x. So x must, must have gotten moved to y, a point in its orbit, through the application of some group element, little g. So it's that little g that we're going to use here. We're going to say this is little, little g times g of x. It's that left coset where g, now we've got a slight problem here, is one of the elements that satisfy, because there could be many of them, is the problem. One of the elements that satisfy g of x equals y. we'd have to do, the first thing we'd have to do, I think, is to prove that this mapping is well defined. <laughs> well, so that you need to be looking at the question. So the question asks us, prove that there's a bijection between the set of or the, the orbit and the set of left cosets of stabilized. So this is the set of left, this is the set of left all left cosets of the stabilizer. This is the orbit of X. So to prove there's a bijection, that means a one-to-one -one and on two mapping. So I gotta figure I, I gotta decide what the mapping is, and then I can prove it's a bijection. Okay. So this there's only one reasonable way to try, I think, and construct this mapping. Because you have to define a value phi for every element little y from this domain. Okay? So you have to associate some left coset of the stabilizer gx with this y. And it has to be done in a reasonable way coming from the group action. So the way to get it is, well, y has come from the orbit of x, so y must be an image under the action of one of the elements from G. So, a, so, so you find a little G that's, that gives you G of X equal to Y, and you use that as the representative of the left coset. That's a natural way of associating a left coset with Y. But there's a slight problem, because there's, there's potentially many choices for the element of G. Because you can have different elements that will send X to Y 
and they could potentially give rise to different cosets. This is the first thing we'll, <coughs> we'll prove is that this mapping is well defined. And okay. that delta G is from? Uh, from the group G, of course. From the group G. Yeah, one of the elements in G, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this map is well defined. For if G prime, if G prime also satisfies G prime X equals Y, then, okay, we're gonna have to prove that the coset, the left coset corresponding to G prime is the same as this one. How do you prove left two left cosets are equal? They are both the same as uh, equal to y, so they are the same. No, but, but the question is, so if G prime also satisfies this, then this left coset we claim is equal to this left coset. So we need a proof of that. In order to prove that, we need to be able to write G prime as G times, so we will show that G prime is an element of the left coset GX, okay? That will do it. If we can show that, that will show that the two left cosets are the same. Okay. So in order to do that, this is true. <clears throat> How do you write G prime as G times something? There's only one way to do it. It has to be G inverse G prime. That's how you write G prime as G times something. And now I just have to observe that this element, G inverse G prime, comes from the stabilizer. How do you prove that G inverse G prime is in the stabilizer? You apply it to X, and you show that it takes the value, that when this element acts on X, it gives you the value X. This is equal, this is equal to G inverse G prime acting on X. By definition, this is G inverse times this Y that I've picked up out here. But G is the property that G acts on X to give you Y. So G inverse will act on Y to give you, to give you X. So why did you select? Yeah, go on. So equal um, G dash X to Y. Why did I decide? So we call that D, replace that G dash D X to because G prime also satisfies G prime X equals Y. So G prime X can be replaced with Y. And then you're applying G inverse to the element Y, but G is the mapping that sends X to Y, so G inverse is the mapping that sends Y to X. So G, G inverse, it, G inverse G prime is in the stabilizer. So that means G prime is in this left coset, so that means the, these two left cosets are. So therefore, we've, we have shown that G prime is in this left coset, so therefore G prime, GX equals G, 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 X. So this shows that our <coughs> mapping is well defined. So phi is well defined, it doesn't matter doesn't matter which choice I finish this off now. It doesn't matter which choice of little g you take, as I said, we'll, we'll define phi. In order to define the value phi of y, you have to choose a little g where which is one of the elements that sends x to y. It 
doesn't matter which one you take, because if you chose another one that also did that, if you chose a G prime, you'd say, oh, you'd make five Y be this left coset, but it's going to be the same left coset as, as, as the other thing. Okay. So it's a well-defined. <coughs> So now we just have to show that it's one to one and on to. When I write things out, when I write things out, I tend to. I hope you haven't organized one of these questions for uh, I mean, you could accept, you could skip this well-defined part initially. You could just define the map and then go ahead and show that it's one to one and onto, assuming this well-defined part. That would be a legitimate way to proceed. Assuming this is true. Yeah. So now we need to show. Now need to show phi is one to one and on to. Is it all four marks? Oh no, no, six marks. Six marks. Six marks. Six marks. I mean, still. <laughs> So suppose 5y1 equals 5y2, so you show something's one to one, i.e. the g1 in this left coset of x is equal to this left coset of x, where g, remember g1 of x equals y1, g2 of x equals y2. But if these two cosets are equal, that implies that uh, G2 inverse G1 is an element of the stabilizer, G2x. is G, G2 inverse on Y, 2. It's in the stabilizer, so that implies G2 inverse, ah, G2 inverse G1x equals x. Yeah, this is the way I do. It's in the stabilizer, that means it fixes x. <coughs> so this applied to x is equal to x, and that implies G1x equals 
G2x, so you multiply both sides on the left by G2. But that's saying that y1 is equal to y2. So that's how you get the y1 equal y2. So that shows it's one to one. So why did you uh, write it like that? Well, this, you know, that's inverse G1, not G. Because that's that's how you that's that's a consequence of the two left cosets being equal. Yeah, but how did you move from there to the next part? Well, because being in the stabilizer means when you act on X, you get the value X back. That's the definition of the stabilizer. Okay. Yeah, when you act on X, you get X back. And then multiplying both sides by G2 cancels this G2 inverse, and I get G2x here. But then that's y1 equals y2. OK, it's, it's 5 2. I'm going to have to stop there. But m my next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get all the solutions up. So there is a much more. Yeah, actually, the solution we have in the book is actually, or in the, the notes here, is actually doing it a slightly different way, slightly more economical way. It's another way to, to look at as well. But I think that but the rest will be easy. I think proving onto, you should be able to prove onto now as well. proving onto. It's really weird. You have to take any possible left coset and show that you can generate it. That's that's easy. But we just that's straightforward. So the onto part is straightforward. We're on to G is an element of G. And then phi of Y will be equal to G this left coset where y, which is equal to g, acting on x, and that's certainly an element of the orbit of x. So the onto part comes, comes by definition. OK, so I'll post the rest of the, uh, the solutions. I'm going to stop that.